Yeah. Yeah. Well, only reason I knew was when I came in this morning and I saw it on the door. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, fine. Now then, just be sure you get these things under there. And those of you that are absent, you need to see one of your friends and get this information that we are copying down. Uh, but be sure you put that on there and get there. Now, if you'll listen up with the other ear while you write with one, um, I want to give you a little word about the whiteboards. The whiteboards are going to cost $22. I talked to Randy Grant last night. And I'm so sorry, he only has 20. And we had 24 people who signed up. So what we'll do is, if you're going to be here next year, uh, I'm quite sure, at least hopefully, he'll be able to be making us some more. And uh, we all uh, can get some then. So we'll let the seniors and the, those that are graduating that are leaving have first dibs. Um, so, or we can just do it like this. First come with the money, first served. And uh, we'll just go that way with it and make the checks out to Randy Grant, or you can give me cash, whichever. So we'll just go with that and uh, try to um, see if we can accommodate everybody who seems to feel that that's a very important first time for us. Uh, for first time for them to get it, or excuse me, only chance for them to get it. So we'll do it like that. All right? Now, tell what I'm going to do. Uh, I'll put this back up in just a moment. I'm going to turn this off for a minute because I want to show you two or three uh, more charts just to give you a little feel for it. And I'm going to ask Richard if you will take... Uh, we'll take the end just right here and hold that up over there. Then I'll just sort of hold it. We'll just go that way with it. And I'll hold this up right here. Uh, I want just to show this to you. Now, this is an old one that was from a number of years back. It's been Xerox. And it's over there in that metal holding thing. So don't forget those are over there. It would be well worth your time to glance through those and look at those. Uh, and the reason I want you to see this is we either, we, it's easy to go to one extreme or the other, and that is to have it either too simplistic or too cluttered. I want you to realize that this one is rather simplistic, and yet it is really quite effective for what is here. Now, you might could add a few little things and maybe put a little bit more in one or two places, but you've got the big, big, big steps. And I, actually, we can sort of say that these charts that sort of have gone through a little period of evolution and uh, they've changed and gone from here to there to the other. But I think that this will give you a feel for the simplicity, and yet at the same time, it is really covered well. And there are some over there that I think you can get some ideas from. Thank you, Richard. Sure. Uh, then something that will be helpful, I believe, uh, for the sake of those of you that uh, will get a good uh, uh, enjoyment out of this, this is Ed Butler's. And he asked for permission to do his in Hebrew. And I said, that's great if you get Dr. Byer to check the Hebrew. And so he did. And he and Dr. Byer worked up the little names and the little whatever they're going to do. So all of this is, all of this is, you know, channeling Genesis 1 to 11 and all the rest of it. So uh, they, they checked it out. But I want to let you see uh, what he did. He used those pictures from the clip art book. And uh, notice that he's colored them, made them bright, made them colorful. One thing I want to warn you about, and that is use of construction paper. Construction paper will fade, and you have to be very careful about it. Um, I do not know that if you laminate it, it will fade. I don't know. But I do know that it will fade the sun if it's exposed to digital light over a period of time. There is a type of paper you can buy that's called fadeless paper. It's a bright uh, sort of a slicky, glossy, not, not glossy, glossy, but it's a slick looking paper. And it won't fade. And you can get those at um, uh, office supply places, at teacher supply stores, uh, perhaps at craft stores. So you might want to just look into that. Uh, but just keep that in mind that it may do that for you. Yes? What is the price for the fancy paper compared to? I'm it, sorry? Is it a lot more expensive than that? I'm really not sure. I'm just really not sure. So, uh, but this is the one that's, uh, that was his. So take a look at this, and I think that you'll get this, uh, this idea that, um, of what's here. He used a lot of symbols, like this is for the, the murder uh, of uh, Cain, of Abel. And then that's just uh, the ungodly, you know, they're getting more and more, and then this is the flood uh, that comes. 
And then, uh, this is our sons, I miss their names. And uh, then this is Judah with the scepter, and this is Joseph with the colored coat. So that gives you a little bit of a, a feel for, uh, for that. And then you see how bright and colorful, I mean, it really does help. And you want to keep that in mind. I'll just jump through now and pick up several uh, things for you. And uh, I'm not sure what that one is. <laughs> uh, that must be the 400 silent years. And I imagine that's Galatians 4, 4, the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. I imagine that's what that is. Uh, then this is what he did for the, um, um, I'm not sure what this is. That was the, the chart, I mean, his narration explained it. This is the birth of Jesus. Oh, the scepter, he uses the idea of the scepter. And he kept the Hebrew emphasis, mm -hmm. the Jewish emphasis. Uh, and then that's uh, Jesus at 12, and then this is his public ministry. Um, and then that's the miracle, and then this is the crucifixion and uh, the resurrection. And then this is the book of Acts and uh, this. And what he did was, you see how he used the little pictures? The pictures are a lot of times against the backdrop of something that gives you a little bit more of a feel. So I thought that was quite clever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want you to see those. And then Martha Fulton, who works in field ed, took the uh, course uh, in Faith Venture Visuals. Some of you are familiar with that uh, course. And they have um, um, printing guides and things that are very, very uh, professional looking. And things that you can copy things from and run things off and these little guys and these special little pencils and all. So um, Martha took it and she wanted to use that for her chart. And I said, fine, go to it. So this is just one of the things that she did in putting together her chart, like her introduction. Uh, the Bible tells God's plan for purchasing us, and she used the theme purchasing us, uh, like buying us back. And then you notice she says the, the channel for it, the need for it, the channel for it, getting ready for it, the purchase of it. She didn't put that. Uh, telling about it, writing about it, the climax of it, and she just, of the, of the purchase. And then she had this that just tied it all together. And that was more or less her introductory thing. I think that's how she used it. But let me show you what uh, the frame looks like, her first frame. Now, you see the printing? The printing goes on these special little things, and you have these special little pens. And you can check with Miss Reichel. And she can give you these and show you what these pens are and how to use them. But this is what she did, like this is Genesis 1 to 11. And here's the creation. And here is the entrance of sin. And then sin multiplied until there was the, the flood. See, she didn't put in about Cain and Abel, um, which in her choice she chose not to because she was trying to get everything on one sheet. And that's the Tower of Abel. And that's fine. And in her narration, she was explaining what she was doing. The idea was that in your narration, you would have to bridge from here to here by telling how sin multiplied and how sin just grew and people got more and more upon the earth. And, and then, you know, you'd have to, your narration would make that have sense. Okay? Now, let me show you one more because in connection with this, uh, they did these little sticky on little overlays and little sticky on things. And this also shows that she would add things as she would teach it. Like this was Gideon and Samson, and see, that you can, you can put that on or, or, or erase it, take it off. But this is a channel for it, the channel for the purchase, the dark age of the nation, judges and Ruth, and the time of the judges. Um, and... Um, these little things stick on there. They sinned, and God punished them, and then they repented, and God sent a deliverer, and then he gave them peace. And so that gives you a little, a little feel for it. And uh, so I want you to see that. You see, she just fixes little things like this, and you just stick these little things on there. Now, if you haven't had that course um, and you don't know about how these work, then you would just have to, maybe I guess I'm going to show you how to do that. But they had these special things that they did in the course. And I wanted you to be sure that you saw it. Okay. And then she fixed up this nice thing to put it in because you have to put these little 
pieces of paper in between. So if any of you do plan to use transparencies, uh, you might want to look at this, and I think it would be helpful for you if you, uh, if you did. All right. Um, where is my little sheet of paper that tells me all our next little string? Okay, we'll go to our next ring in our circus. And the next ring in our circus is over here on the wall. Um, yesterday, I, um, I mean Monday, I believe, did I walk through these with you? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We're ready. Oh, one thing, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to tell you about, and that is in connection with the book of Psalms, you have the book of Psalms, and it has an S on it. But when you talk about that you're going to read one of those Psalms, you don't say, I'm going to read Psalms 23 or Psalms 1. No, it's just Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Psalm 100, from the book of Psalms. So be sure that you got that clear. And uh, that's a very common mistake that you hear people are going to read Psalms 1. Well, no, it's, it's just one of those Psalms. So it's Psalm 1. Now, kids are wonderfully creative. And uh, some of you may have heard some silly things that people use to remember the order of books. Well, several years ago, Don Grant uh, taught Bible up in the public schools in Cabarrus County, North Carolina. And she, her students were memorizing, her high school students were memorizing the books of the Bible. And they got to this whole list of minor prophets, and they couldn't remember which one came where. And they kept drilling and everything else. And so she said, well, now, can you think of any ways that you could remember these? So they made up some crazy, crazy ways to remember it. Now, sometimes the way to remember is as hard to remember as the, as the books of the Bible. But nevertheless, you know how kids are. So let me just throw this out to you, because it really was quite creative. You got, let's say the minor prophets together, pronounce them. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. All right. Now, um, heaven just ain't over Jordan. Uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. See the first letter? Heaven just ain't over Jordan. Now, if that helps you, use it. If you think it's stupid and silly and would embarrass you, don't even mention it. <laughs> Heaven just ain't over Jordan. They're taking the first letter and they're making up this little silly sentence. And Heaven H J Jordan A for ain't. Uh, o for over and J for Jordan. I mean A. All right. Heaven just. Sorry. J J J Anyway, that's just silly. Ain't. It's a, it's a terrible thing. It's not correct. Adopt me. Don't say it. It's not a good word. It's not an ugly word, but it's a, it's a, it's poor English. It's not good. English. But in the South, you will hear it a lot. I'm afraid. Uh, heaven just ain't over Jordan. The next one is my neighbor has zits. So Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Now this is the better. His zipper malfunctions. So uh, she just thought they were cute, and she sent them to me. And she says, "Miss Wilkes, I think you would appreciate this." She said, "This is typically high school thinking for you." So uh, if you can remember that heaven is saying over Jordan, and my neighbor has zits and zipper malfunctions, then the first letter of each of those would be the order of those minor prophets. So if it helps you, if it's doesn't, go forget it. Let's move to the New Testament, though, and take a look here. You've got in the New Testament 27 books, and you've got five divisions. And what are these five divisions in the New Testament? Gospels, history, Paul's, uh, uh, Paul's letters, Paul's epistles, uh, general epistles, and prophets. And prophets. Now, the, letter, the word epistle is an old English word that means letter. And children today have not heard it. And children today can be suggestive in their little thinking. And if you say epistles, you're probably going to see some little giggling around because they think that you're trying to say a little ugly word. And uh, children are terrible and they're wonderful, but their little minds just work all sorts of ways. So it would be better in your group to say Paul's letters than do something. I'll just do it with a little straight face and just very emphatically, you know, say epistles. Now that's an old word. It's a very fancy word. If you learn that, you know, you make it a real good and exciting experience. But uh, anyway, that's, that's what you've got there. The Gospel, thank you, Martin Luke John. History, Acts, got an S on it, don't forget. It has an X, S on it. Then Paul's letters. 
Now we put Hebrews in with this listing. If you want to put it with general letters or others, other letters, that is fine. <clears throat> but just be sure that you get it in there and that you put an S on it. Hebrews. Um, Romans, look at look at the last of all those words. You've got Romans, and you've got Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. It's all got that I A N S on the tail end. And that will help you to remember. You don't have to worry about it. Is it I O N or I A N? Well, it's just I A N. Every one of them is the same. I A N. Um, some of you may have heard this. Remembering Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. General Electric Power Company, all right. Uh, Girls eat popcorn. Uh, Gentiles eat pork chops. Pardon? <laughs> Gentiles eat pork chops. Gentiles eat pork chops, all right. Anything, <laughs> that just uh, then you said something silly, if that helps the music. Uh, the, and then other epistles, James, Peter, John, Jude. And then Revelation. Only one does not have an S on it does not have an S on it. Don't say the book of Revelation and stuff. No, it was only one revelation that John had. The book of Revelation. So don't say you're going to read Revelation 3.20. No, you're going to read Revelation 3.20. Okay, we got it? Yes, I said. Some people, uh, you write the letters in the two groups. Like, uh, letter to the church? Yes. Letter to the individual? Oh no, that's the three. Then, then no letter. Yes, right, right. And, um, I, and, and I've heard them done that way, like general letters or letters of Paul and others' letters or pastoral epistles and general epistles. I've heard both of those divisions. For our sake, let's just go ahead and keep it like this. And Paul's letters and the letters of other people. Okay, now say them through one time. Be sure you can pronounce them all. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. Titus has two T's in it. Titus, Titus. It's, it, it's, it's hard to pronounce it, to overpronounce it. Titus. 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 Okay, good. All right, fine. Now, I want us to pray, uh, especially for Spring Conference for Columbia 91, and pray for those who do all the dirty work behind the scenes. And uh, that's uh, the unsung heroes of a, of a weekend like this. Let's pray especially for the levels and for Mark uh, Silvers and Mrs. Steed and Randy Rayburn and those cooks and all the kitchen workers because that's a biggie, 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 biggie thing for the weekend and full people in the dish pit especially. And uh, so let's, uh, let's pray for them. Then let's pray. Mr. German is the uh, person who is the uh, uh, director, I'm sort of like the organizer for all this. I pray for Mr. Ed German. And especially for Mrs. Matthews, who is the hostess of the school, and then uh, Mrs. Uh, Heath and uh, Mr. Morgan, Jay Morgan, uh, who will be helping with all the housing and everything. Uh, are there any of you, and that's not correct, camera, is there any one of you uh, in here, are, are there a group of you, anyway, uh, are any of you, <laughs> anybody in here uh, on the committee, uh, the, the Columbia 91 committee? Student committee, okay, uh, you are, and you are, okay, good. So let's pray uh, for these folks because they'll be having responsibilities, and uh, let's ask the Lord to undertake for them. As we pray, um, Mark, I'm going to ask you if you'll lead in prayer and pray for these folks that do this behind the scene work, and then especially for Mr. German and those that are working with him. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you. Because you're the one who can do these things. If we could do them ourselves, we'd be about being busy and we'd um, do our best. But we know, Lord, that you're the one who really needs to because this is a spiritual thing. Having brought these young people here, we want to teach them your word. We want to show them a new way of life. Many of them will have experienced it. Some of them will not have. So we pray that your spirit will be providing for the fun, the entertainment, the spiritual times, the singing times, the sharing times so that uh, when they come away from here, they can say that they have experienced the Lord Jesus himself. 
and maybe some of them will, will come away also with a new relationship with me. And so we pray that with a lot of thanksgiving because you will be the one to be doing this. And so we pray for those who are preparing, particularly for those that work so hard and have worked so hard for the past month or so, getting this ready and just give them joy in their, in their uh, endeavors. Um, thank you for the levels and all that work with them in the kitchen. And may everything go smoothly for them. Even now as today, Mrs. Baker will be there in the dining room. And that will be something that they'll have to do even in the midst of their busy schedule. So help them and give them a lot of joy. And we pray for uh, Mrs. Matthews and Edgerman Mann and uh, student life directors in the men's and women's dorm. And I just pray that you will give them the peace that you will take all care of all the little nooks and crannies that they can't see and that they won't know about until they happen. Give them the peace that will be evident to all. Thank you for this class. Give us a blessing in chapel today, and may all that we do be for your glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> all right, folks. Since we don't have one of these things for Bible class, you know what one of those things are? You know what one of those things is? You know what this mm -hmm. is? This is what is called a teacher's text. It's that thing that teacher had when she taught you that you thought she knew so much. Uh, your book looked like this, and you thought her book did too. You just thought hers was a little bit better because it had a little darker, uh, it had a, a big, uh, maybe a hard cover on the back. But you get to looking at it, and lo and behold, you find out that your book is right there in her book. But all around your book are these wonderful little helps to tell her what to do, to tell him what to do, how to teach the lesson. Now, I'm just digging a little fun at you, poking a little fun at you, because this thing that we talked about yesterday, that there is no such thing as a teacher's text for teaching the Bible. In other words, uh, I don't have mine with me, but if I had my Bible in my hand, I couldn't pick up my Bible and then say, all right, here's the teacher's text, and duplicate it right there in that teacher's text for all these lessons in the Bible with a little lesson plan all around them about what you do with them. Uh, it just doesn't exist. There is no such thing. Now, since that is true, and I don't have that, I've got to have some help, though. Because, I mean, I can't just reinvent the wheel and start all over from scratch. Is there any way that I can get some help that it will help me arrange and be able to at least maybe come up with my own curriculum, which is basically what a good teacher eventually ends up doing anyway? Yes, there are. And one of those things is the purpose of this course, and that's to equip you to be able to construct or to prepare a Bible curriculum. And the first thing, and the first way of doing it, is to acquaint you with what is available. Now, <clears throat> let's stop here for just a moment and tell you, uh, and let me tell you, that you may not believe this, but because you are a Bible college graduate and you have a degree in Bible, somebody's going to put two and two together in the church where you are when you leave here. Uh, and they're going to say, oh, you've got a Bible major. You know all about the Bible. You're just the person we need to serve on this committee that we put together here for maybe our Christian school that's connected with our church. We want you to serve on our committee and help us with our Bible curriculum. Or somebody in the church may say, well, we've got a youth group that we've been trying to put together. We're trying to get our youth program. And we need somebody to coordinate what we're teaching in our youth program in Sunday school and on Sunday nights and in their special outreach in the summertime. You're a Bible college graduate. You know how to do that. So you put together a Bible curriculum for that. Now, I'm saying that with not with tongue in cheek. I am saying that from past experience. You'd be surprised how many phone calls I've had, how many letters I've had. Miss Phillips, help. Uh, I am in this church, and they have done so-and-so, and they want me to do such-and-such. And, such. and um, just remember, we're here, and we'll help you any way we can. But uh, let me see if I can get you a little bit more secure so you won't just faint when they say that to you. Several years ago, Mary Shetler graduated from here, married a young man in her hometown in Jacksonville, Florida, and they were very active in their home church. Uh, uh, and connected with that was a Christian school. So <clears throat> the next time I saw Mary, I don't know if she was visiting here or whether I was in Jacksonville or what, but she, uh, she said, Miss Phillips, she said, you're not going to believe this. 
But she says, guess what board, what committee in the church I have been appointed to. She says, I have been appointed to the board of directors for the Christian school. And I said, yay, are you surprised? And she laughed. She says, no, because you told me that something like that might happen to me. I said, well, now you can help them with their Bible curriculum. Now you can help them get the best Bible curriculum possible. So, uh, but I'm just saying that to you because it'll happen. But the next thing I want to say is, is to let you know that whenever we start preparing this thing about a curriculum, we're going to do in about two, three sessions what is actually majors or, or uh, people get their master's degree in curriculum and instruction and they take courses and courses and courses and courses and uh, in, in many programs you have at least some sort of a full course in curriculum design. Now I used to teach a course in curriculum design in the Bible teaching program several years ago but because of numerous reasons, one main one that you know after a while you can just you have to cut something out and I had to drop that uh, but it was one of my funnest courses to teach because it was with the student teachers after they came back from student teaching and we would put together a curriculum and we'd talk about, we had a little mini course in curriculum design and then we, we would plan things and you're going to be able to uh, plan curriculum, you're going to be able to see some of the units that they wrote whenever you do your homework, which I'm going to explain in just a little while, uh, about visiting the curriculum lab and you'll see some of the materials that they used. But this is what we want to do, and that's to acquaint you with what is available. I would like to warn you that what is available out there is a lot, well, let me encourage you, there's a lot more now than it was 10 years ago, and there is surely a lot more now than it was 20 years ago. There was a time at which, folks, it just did not exist out there. Bible curriculum for school teaching just did not exist. A lot of people took, uh, I know, Christian schools of a number of years ago, who took the gospel light at that time, the Henrietta Mears publications, uh, of their Sunday school material because they were one of the few that went through the Bible. And I know that <clears throat> there were some schools who used that. Today there is a lot more, but I'd like to warn you about it, and there are two things that are very important. One is, very little of it will reflect the pattern of biblical revelation. And the other thing is that a lot of what's available is either one or two, I think, bad extremes. One is it's, it does not handle it with integrity in the sense in which it makes just about every lesson salvation. Or it goes the other extreme and it's just pure facts and knowledge and cognitive information. And many times it deteriorates into workbooks and uh, filling out workbook sheets and the kids get bored and they don't like it and it, it's just it's sad. So we've got a real problem. We've got a real problem with Bible curriculum. Many, many, many people have said you should write a Bible curriculum. When are you going to write a Bible curriculum? I am not sure that such a thing is practical or, or should be done. Now there are generic things that, are, that should be true, I think, in any Bible curriculum. But every local situation is so, so unique but I think that every local situation needs to have a good, clear understanding, and they, they, they need to have sort of a curriculum uh, consultant who can help them put together a curriculum, but help them realize that they basically are going to have to make their own courses to fit their own particular needs with their children. Some of the best courses that I have seen uh, have been done by teachers who teach in the public schools who prepare their own materials and uh, are not tied into a uh, curriculum because they just, they're just, the Bible is a textbook and they just expect to teach the Bible like you go teach history or science. You're the Bible teacher so you know where to get your materials. So some of the best materials I've seen have come out of that kind of situation. So what we're going to do is try to point you with what's available. So to get you started on that, I want to explain to you your assignment that you have on week four, number two. Will you turn your syllabus to week four, number two, and let me explain to you uh, what we're going to be doing with that. <clears throat> week four, number two. Okay, you ready? 
look on if you need to with someone. Uh, examine the Bible curriculum. Uh, in, examine Bible curriculum in the Bible teaching curriculum lab. Now downstairs, on this build, in this building, on the first floor, that room that when you come in from the library in, the first one on the right, is across the top of it, it says Bible teaching curriculum lab. And in there are materials that we have collected over the years trying to find anything that's in print that's been used in schools or that's been printed for schools, Christian schools as well as public schools. And we've got them all in there and we've tried to collect them. And we've done this over a period of years and it took us a long time. And little by little we find a few other little things and we sort of filter those in too. So let me explain to you what you do. You're to do it for an hour and a half. This is the assignment for an hour and a half. And you use your curriculum resource list as a guide. Your curriculum resource list is pages 108G, 1, 2, 3, and 4 in your resource books. Pages 108G, numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. See, there are all kinds of ways to number things if you want to insert something that wasn't in there when you first did it. Well, that's how we've done it. So that is the, the list that you have. Now what you do is you take your list, and you take your book down there if you want to, or take it out of your book, and have it with you, and you go down there, and you look at the shelves. When you go in the door, now watch me. When you go in the door, to the left, you turn like this, and on that wall, which is the hall wall downstairs, are bookcases. And then right here, there are bookcases. And alphabetically arranged on those bookcases, are these materials that we have available. And they have names on the little, sh uh, the little uh, uh, shelves, and you can see them there. And they're in little boxes and little filing boxes and so forth. And you take those off and you put them down there on the table. We've got several six or eight chairs down there. And several of you can work at a time. And you can go in there anytime you want to, and I'll explain how you get in there in a minute. But you use those and you look at them, and then when you get through, you put them back in a little box and put it back on that shelf, as close as, as you about it if you possibly can. Now, I want to point out to you the ones that are the most commonly used and probably the most popular Bible curriculum that's used in Christian schools. I am not saying that these are everything that you'd want them to be, but I am saying that these are the ones that are used the most. Number A at the top of your page there, the Abeka Book Publishers. Now, this is page 108G, now page 1. Abeka Book Publishers. Good. Okay. Abeka Book Publishers. Then, if you will come over to number H, Bob Jones University Press. And then number I. Uh, number I is Christian Schools International. And Christian Schools International is the CSI schools, the old National Union of Christian Schools, which are mostly Christian schools up in Minnesota, Michigan, up in that area in the Dutch Reformed uh, territory. Iowa has a number of them. Any of you by any chance from the, uh, know about or are you from the Kono schools in Iowa? Okay. This is sort of a satellite type schools that they are all over that area and they uh, tie in with the CSI people. Uh, Ken Byers, who spoke to us the other day, the school he's in is a CSI school. The uh, school that is Covenant Christian uh, Academy here in Columbia with Covenant Christian Church is a CSI school. The Westminster Christian School in Augusta is a CSI school. We don't have very many. <clears throat> Most of them in this area are the ACSI schools, the Association of Christian Schools International. <clears throat> and ACSI does not have a Bible curriculum they have published. They're working on Are they working on one? It's interesting. I would like to, I sure would like to give some input. Uh, I didn't know they were working on one. Uh, they don't have one uh, yet, but CSI does, and I want you to make a note under number I. Add that, if you haven't already, because this is new. came out about three years ago. And that, uh, <clears throat> that publication is chronological. 
Now, it would take a Bible college graduate, I think, to really appreciate it and teach it because it's really quite ambitious. Uh, but it is chronological. I had the privilege, and this was real fun, I had the privilege of uh, having an in-service for the elementary teachers at Briarwood Christian School in, in Birmingham, Alabama several years ago. And they were moving to, they were going in to use this curriculum. And I did not know that until I was getting ready to go. Because I had planned I was going to be doing the chart with them and try to help the Bible teachers in their classes as do the regular classroom teachers teach the Bible classes in the elementary school there. And I was going to be sure that they help the Bible teachers that they got a story of the Bible. And then lo and behold, it turned out that their new curriculum just fit this. And it, it just saved the day for them because a lot of them were not Bible college graduates. They did not have Bible training in their background. And they would not have had, if they hadn't have gotten that overview, they wouldn't have actually had a, a picture of what was there. So that was very exciting to be involved in that. Then, number M at the bottom, Lifeway Bible Series. The Scripture Press Company publishes this one. And this is a takeoff of an old, uh, an old publishing company from the West Coast a number of years ago, the ABCD, the Association of Bible Curriculum Development. And they bought them out, and then now Scripture Press publishes it. But it's called Lifeway Bible Series. And what I want you to do is this. When you go down to the, uh, to the curriculum lab, you take your sheet with you, and you just look. Now, I don't expect you to cover all of them. There's no way you could look at all of them in an hour and a half. But I want you just to look at them and see what they are. And, and anything that particularly is interest to you, make a little note on here. And you may see one or two of you say, I, I, I don't even understand how that one works. I, I don't, I, that, that, one's, that one's confusing. Need more time on that one. Or um, uh, that, that's terrible looking. The artwork is just so awful. I don't think children would even enjoy that one. But then if you find something that sort of gets your fancy and you look at it, uh, open it up, take it out, look at your table of contents. Sometimes they'll have a scope and sequence book with it showing you what it's all about from beginning to end. And uh, then you just look at that and maybe make some notes of the ones that you think are the stronger ones and spend 5, 10, 15 minutes looking at several of them that are of particular interest to you. Maybe take one that you like particularly and read a whole lesson in it. It won't take you that long. Uh, and that'll give you a little feel for how they do it. You understand what you need to do? Now then, the only other instruction I have for you is this. It's how to get in there and how to get out of there and what to do. In the library, there is a key. It says that you can get the, uh, the library, you can get the key from the library. It's available at the checkout desk in the LRC. You are not to take those materials out of there. There's a table down there. There's chairs down there. You can work down there. You're going to be signed in groups. You can go any time, day or night, that the LRC is open so you can get a key and get in there. Um, but if you check the key out, it's like checking a book out. You have to sign a card. When you do, your name's on the dotted line. And if something happens and somebody wants to get in there and there's nobody in there to let them in and you have long gone over to Dutch Square to get you a cup of yogurt, uh, frozen yogurt with the key, we're going to put your name on a neon sign, and we're going to put it out there on campus, right by, you know, right here at the main drag. It's going to say, Chris Osiki took the LRC key to the Bible Hitch and Greek Lab to Dutch Square. He is a bad boy. So, no, we won't do that, but I'm trying to make a point, and that is that key should stay in your hand. You check it out. It's got your name over there. You go. You open the door. You keep it with you. And your good friend, Mark, comes along, and he says, oh, come on, Chris. I'll take the key back for you. And you say, no. Ms. Phillips told me I couldn't let you do that. And that's exactly right. <laughs> Don't you let anybody else have it. You fix the door so that who's in there can, when they leave, they can pull it to it and it'll shut, and you go take the key back. Don't take it to lunch with you. Uh, don't run over to your room with it. Uh, Get it, take it back. In other words, you're either between the library and the MRD, uh, and the uh, Bible Teaching Curriculum Lab with it, or else it's in there with you, or it's at the desk, so that everybody can get in. Now, you will be assigned by groups. Haven't none of that. I haven't fixed it yet, but we we are going to try to get that uh, work this week, and we are starting today to start to get everything organized down there, and then you'll be able to get in. I'll just tell you when you should start, because I'll assign you by groups. Is that clear what your assignment is? It's going to be lasting through the rest of the quarter, and uh, that'll, that'll help you to get it. All right, fine. Now then, what are we going to do? One of our goals is to 
help you learn how to fix the Bible curriculum? Well, we've got to acquaint you with what's available. And what is available is what we have just talked about. So, what are we going to do? Well, we've got to expose you to steps uh, of how to take this and set it up and get your curriculum fixed. So what we're going to do, uh, I think the wisest thing will be for us to stop here because this is as far as we got uh, in the other class and uh, I'm, I don't know exactly what we did. We just talked a bit faster maybe in here than I did the last class. Or maybe didn't have quite as many questions. But what I want to know is if there are any questions about your narration that, that I could help you with as a group before I dismiss you. Yes? Each, each narr point of the narration should go with each of the points on, on these charts. And of course, if the, the outline you've given us matches these. Do you want us to give a, a point for each sub-point in, in the charts or just <coughs> an overall general view of that major All right. Th good question, and that's very important. One of the things I wanted to emphasize to you, you may notice on some of these charts that they may have a number, just a number for the chart, num number for each frame. You may see other charts that's got little numbers all over it in different places, and you may have three or four numbers at one place. Let me just uh, illustrate with Marcus here for just a moment. Uh, that I think that would just uh, that'd be a good way to uh, explain that. Here is her first frame. But I've got right here, this it says one, two, three, four. You see that? There's just one frame. But I know that that first paragraph on her chart deals with that. And excuse me, on her narration deals with that. Then I will know, that's number two, that the next paragraph on her narration deals with this. And then I will know that the next paragraph deals with this, and the next paragraph deals with this, because she numbered it on that little thing right there. You see, uh, you can have more than one part of the flowing of the story on a frame. Or if you make a whole long chart together, I mean, obviously it'll, it'll be moving along. You can certainly do that. But whatever you have that makes the story move to another step, be sure it's numbered. Okay, you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you've got them maybe all on one frame. You can just number your paragraph uh, however it would fit on your frame and maybe your paragraph would look like this and you might have three numbers in your paragraph. That's all right. Just so we can see the paragraph and know that there's going to be a frame that's going to represent that. Does that under help you? Uh, length, folks, um, let's don't go to a 20, 25 page production. Uh, try to keep it within a six to eight pages single, t single spaced. Be more, of course, if it's, if it's double spaced. Um, and don't we will assume some prior knowledge because I don't expect you to tell the story of Abraham and tell the story of Isaac and tell the whole story of Jacob. You see what I'm saying? But you want to pick your theme and go through it so that you can move through the big segments. The biggest thing you're going to be tempted to do is get the bog down in your stories. And you don't, don't do that. Uh, just, just back off. Keep, and if you, if you begin to see yourself doing it, we'll just jump off and just say, okay, now how can I say that in two sentences? and then just try to say it in two sentences and then fix it accordingly. Remember, you want to keep putting in those keywords or referring back to whatever your theme is. Like, for instance, Martha's was on uh, purchasing. Well, the approach could be, I mentioned this a while ago, like you go purchase something. What do you do when you go purchase something? Well, you buy it. Well, why do you buy it? Well, because you want it. And, I mean, that could be a little approach that would get you started and then that would move you into this wonderful thing that God had made and so forth, and then something happened to it. And then he had to purchase it back. He had to get it back. And then he would carry that theme through. And when you get through the first 11 chapters, well, what's he done right here? Well, that sort of summarized that. And you go to the next one, you sort of, you get through the next. Remember, 12 through, Genesis 12 through Malachi is all one big thing, but you've got those eight big steps through there that you want to sort of summarize when you come to those. Now, doing it, Start writing and just, I mean, I mean get your, do, do your chart and your narration all together. And I think that will help you to keep on track better. Any questions? Yes? Um, 
these kind of going to come see you. Is this just come to your office anytime between those? No, rooms where these lunch? rooms are. Where oh, these okay. rooms are. Sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah. So where the rooms are. here and any person, any, any questions? Right. Like that? Right. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. What time is our narration due on Monday? At 10 o'clock, Monday night. Because you have all day to work on it. Yes. And there's also the assignment for Monday. What time is it due? We have an assignment that's due. Oh, do we? Uh, let me double check that and just see. Thank you for alerting me to that. And I will. Um, is it the um, week five? Um, Henry and Mirrors, what the Bible is all about. I will be. I have no problem about postponing that. That one might help you a little bit. <laughs> might help you a little bit with your assignment. <laughs> it might help you a little bit with your narration. So. Uh, um, but I won't, uh, if you don't get it done that day, I won't worry about that. We'll, we'll work on that. Yeah, you might, though, I mean, you really, I'm seriously, all of a sudden I realize what it is. It really would be helpful probably for you to go ahead and do that because it'll help you tie a lot of the story together. Mm -hmm. So there's no class on Monday. You're right. There is no class on Monday. And the confusion today was that they did not announce that chapel had been switched and that the classes had been switched around. Mm -hmm. So, But there is, there are no classes on Monday after spring conference, after Columbia 91. Now, that's what I've been told. I sure hope I'm not telling the tale. So I haven't seen it announced anywhere, but that's what I've been told. So, okay, good. All right, you're dismissed, folks. You know who you're going to go here, I hope. Who's here? Secretary. which was